just stamp your feet. <laughs> just do this a couple of times. <laughs> right, never really sit down again. <laughs> These things matter, you know. Right. So, uh, Morton, if I could have the, uh, the title slide up, please. Oh, look, there it is. Right. So, Romans 10, 8 to 13. It's, uh, it's a great passage. It's um, at the heart of um, Paul's letter to the emerging church. And it starts... It starts with one of the best quotations, in the best questions in the whole of the Bible. But what does it say? Seriously, as a preacher, this is the best question ever. Because you can apply this question to any passage in the Bible in order to unlock its meaning. But what does it say? What does any passage mean for the people who first heard it? What does it mean for us here and now? And what, therefore, are we called to do in response? For if the word of God is to have any effect on our lives, then the very best question we can ask is simply this. What does it say? So Romans 10. What does it say? As always, uh, with any Bible that starts with a word like but or and or therefore, uh, the best thing to do is look back a little bit and see what Paul is talking about. And if we look back, uh, not just across chapters 9 and 10 of the letter to the Roman church, but across the whole book, we can see that Paul is wrestling with the differences, the disparities, even, between those who have come to the Christian faith through and from Judaism and those who have not, the Gentiles. Paul's worry for his own journey, uh, as much as anyone's, is that Jewish converts to Christianity get too hung up on the law and that this gets in the way of them freely accepting salvation through faith. So the, uh, the Jews believe, the Jews who converted to Christianity believe that they still had to observe all the laws and observances that they had grown up observing. This is why in Paul's letters so often there are arguments about, about fasting, there are arguments about circumcision, there are arguments about, well, pretty much everything, really. Um, and what Paul is wrestling with, with the early church, is saying, no, you don't need to do all these things that you, think you had, thought you had to do before because Jesus has done them for you. If we look back a little bit into chapter 9, verses 30, uh, 30 and a bit after, what are we to say? Gentiles who did not strive for righteousness have attained it. That is to say, righteousness through faith. But Israel, who did strive for righteousness that is based on the law, did not succeed in fulfilling the law. Why not? because they did not strive for it on the basis of faith, but as if it was based on works. So this is not just a specific message for Jewish converts to Christianity in first century Rome. This is a reminder to all of us that we are not saved by works we do not earn our way into heaven some of you will remember the great Tony Hancock some of you will remember the blood donor uh, from Hancock's half hour back in the day and in the blood donor he is, he is having a conversation with another donor 
explaining about his charitable donations. That he has a notebook in which he records all of his charitable donations. I give to every cause going, he says. And when I come face to face with the great architect and he says, what have you done? I'll just give him my notebook and they, there you are, mate, add that lot up. We are not saved by what we do. We do not earn our way into heaven. We do what we do because we are saved, because we have noticed, because we are responding to God's call, because we hear God's call for our lives and choose to do something about it. It is not about keeping the old ways, the old rules, the old traditions. Sometimes it is, sometimes they matter, but it is not solely about doing things the way they've always been done. It is about having faith and trust in Jesus Christ and following his path wherever that may lead. Romans 10, chapter, verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. There may be righteousness for everyone who believes. We're going to hear that again in a minute, slightly differently, but there it is. Christ is the end of the law, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Jesus Christ is the end of the law, Paul says, the fulfillment of the law. Just as Jesus himself promised in the Sermon on the Mount, do not think that I have come to abolish the law. I have not come to abolish it, but to fulfill it. Jesus' promise is that we are saved, not by a rigorous obedience to a million tiny rules, but by belief and trust in him. Which brings us to the passage for today. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. This is at the very core of our beliefs. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And it's important to notice that we are called to both believe this and declare it. Theologian called Michael J. Gorman describes this as Paul's emphasis on both internal conviction and public affirmation. In a trust on one hand, public declaration on the other. I'm going to read a bit more from uh, that nice Mr. Gorman. Those who respond in faith affirming with heart and mouth Jesus' lordship by virtue of God's resurrection of him from the dead, receive justification and righteousness. They are reconciled to God and made part of God's covenant people. And this is what Paul is saying to the early church. That the Jews... Jewish converts who keep the laws and the traditions, the Gentiles who don't, they are all welcomed into the faith. They are all reconciled to God through belief and trust in Jesus Christ. And if you believe in trust in Jesus Christ, you hold that in your heart and 
you declare it with your mouth. Know it, understand it, say it out loud. The inner belief, the outward expression. The two go hand in hand. Always have, always will. And of course, the outward expression isn't just with the mouth. I mean, obviously that helps, keeps me in work. But um, I'm sure many of you have heard the old saying, uh, preach the gospel, use words if necessary. And it's still true. When we do the things that Jesus called us to do, then we are proclaiming the gospel. We are proclaiming his truth. That great list in the parable of the sheep and the goats. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it? that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? When was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? When was it that we saw you sick and in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them. Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these my children, you did it to me. And the answer to the question, which one was this man's neighbor? In the parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke 10, the lawyer said, Jesus says, which one was this man's neighbor? And the lawyer says, the one who showed him mercy and compassion. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. Which one was his neighbor? The one who does what you do, Jesus. Yes, says Jesus. So do that. passage this morning says as scripture says anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame other translations say will never be ashamed the one who believes and trusts and follows him as best we can the one who tries their hardest to follow Jesus' path and walk in his way need not be ashamed. The passage is not calling us to be proud, not in that sense, but I believe, I do believe, that this is calling for us not to continually beat ourselves up if our best efforts fall a bit short. Because that's who we are. All of us have sinned and blundered frequently, whether we meant to or not. All of us have fallen short of God's ideal. And sometimes, yes, you know, our prayer is, Father, forgive us, for we know exactly what we're doing. And God loves us anyway. God knows who we are. God knows this of us. And Jesus understands and speaks on our behalf for all those who call in his name. As it says here, there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all those who call on him. There is no difference. However you came to faith, however long ago, how recently, what your path was, what you knew before, how any of us happened upon this, whether we grew up with it or whether we came to it later in life, whether we kept the old ways and sort of adapted and carried on or whether it sort of all came in a flurry, doesn't matter, doesn't matter. 
because what matters is where you are now. What matters is where we are on this path. There is no difference to how we came to faith. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone. Everyone. There is no asterisk there. There is no footnote in any of the versions I've read. There is no if, no but. There is no qualifying remark or subjunctive clause. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. There's a chap called Andrew Ollerton, you may have come across him, who's written a book on Romans. I'm reading it at the moment. Can you tell? Um, and he's great. And he talks in his chapter on Romans 10, he talks about how God's love is inclusive. It is for everyone. But it is also exclusive in that it is only through Jesus. And so all are welcome, but only through Jesus Christ. As Jesus himself says in John 14, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So our call to action this morning is, is twofold. One is to know and trust this for ourselves, to hold it in our hearts, that God's love is for all of us, even if you think you do not deserve it, even if you think, well, God cannot love me because there are too many things that I have been and seen and done as we theologians say, tough. God loves you anyway. So there. God loves us all. And we should hold that in our heart and know and trust it. And then declare it with our mouths. Let other people know. It goes on straight after this passage to ask that very question. How are they to call on one in whom they have not believed? How are they to believe in one in whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear unless there is someone to proclaim him? And how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Not all have obeyed the good news, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? So faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through the word of Christ. Faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through the word of Christ. So we are called to go out and live our lives as if God is with us. To be salt and light in other people's lives. Again, using words if necessary. To show them love, to show them compassion, to show them mercy, to bring them food and drink and company. We are called, as much as anything else, we are called to gather. To gather with each other, 
to listen, to hear from God, and to act upon what we hear. And we are called to gather with others, just as Jesus did. Jesus went out into the world and lived that life, speaking to other people, telling them his truth. Spending so much time with sinners that others accused him of being a glutton and a drunkard. It's there, it's in the Bible. Spending so much time eating and drinking with people. I mean, obviously, if there's one group of people I don't need to reassure about the importance of the shared meal, I suspect it's us. Yeah. But yes, we are called to share every aspect of our lives, including the truth of what we believe. So, as Jesus said, go do that. Let us see what we are called to do. Let us see what we are called to leave behind. Let us see what we are called to bring to other people's lives and our own. As Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. So we are called to love ourselves as well. And that's a tricky one. Because if we do not love ourselves, we cannot share that love with others. So, what does it say? It says that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, including us. Let's pray.